Okay, our next paper is actually an interesting concept. <laughs> um, it's a little bit confusing, and I'm not sure it solves our problem. So here we go. It's MRA safety, it's the safety of magnetic resonance imaging in patients with cardiac devices. This is by Very Nazarian, Hansford, and I, excuse me, but Rossapar Ra, yeah. um, in New England Journal of Medicine. So it's in the Tada Journal, so this must be great. Yeah. Um, and it was December 2017. And I like the idea. Yes. So I love this idea, because yes. we know that there pace, people with pacemakers and defibrillators may need to get an MR for some reason or another. Yeah. And we don't Is know it whether safe? it's safe. Right. There apparently are, and I didn't know this, some of the devices that are out there, the FDA is considered MRI conditional, meaning that if you have it, they think it's safe for you to go ahead and get in mm -hmm. one of these machines. But we don't really know which of these machines are. We, mm -hmm. Some of them aren't classified one way or the other. And so we just assume that we shouldn't do it. And actually, it's written in all kinds of guidelines not to right. in somebody who has these things. So this study said, you know, away with you. I'm going to try it anyway. So this study basically <laughs> looked at putting these people into MRI. And actually, it's, it's a fascinating study how they did this. I'm not sure it helps us, but it's fascinating. <laughs> so NIH and Johns Hopkins funded this. So it's funded by n nobody with any sort of vested interest, particularly. And they did a big study. Yeah. So we just heard about very little data and using idarucizumab. This is 1,509 patients who had either a pacemaker and or defibrillator. So they had a device. They were enrolled over, get this, a 12-year period. The this is someone like, there's like their career study. This is amazing, I mean, actually. Yeah. And I'm God bless them for trying this. Yeah. The thing, that, this is super important to understand. When they did this study, the devices themselves, before they went into the MRI scanner, the devices were reprogrammed to make sure that they would do a, a, a pacing if it was needed. And all of the sort of other fancy functions were deactivated while the MR was going on. So they're basically made into a VVI pacemaker. They're made yeah. into a backup pacemaker. They did interrogate the devices before and after the MRI. And then after the MRI, they put them back to the way they had been initially. So this, so this wasn't just taking the person with the and device throwing and them putting in a scanner. them in right. so, so this is probably the most important slide of this entire set of slides, of yeah. set of information, is that this is not, you're not going to throw somebody in the scanner. Yeah. You're going to have a cardiologist involved. There's lots of people. It's yeah. not going to be They're just programming you. programming the thing. Exactly. Yeah. It's not going to be just you. They used a particular type, and this is actually the most common MRI scanner, which yeah. is a 1.5 Tesla scanner. There are more others out there now, but that was the type they used. And they talked to the patients by in-room speakers to hear sort of what was happening. And they did have patients on the monitors, but I love this. <laughs> the, they had them on a cardiac monitor and a pulse ox. And what happens in an MRI is the cardiac monitor gets kind of mucked up a little bit. So they had to watch the waveform <laughs> of the pulse ox to it. make sure there was really a still pulse going on. Fortunately, nobody yeah. stopped. But, yeah. but that's how they checked the pulse, and they checked blood pressure every three minutes. Every so three minutes, that's annoying. That, yeah, they're kidding. Think about it. <laughs> like it's just deflating and then it's that's like, right. wait, 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 exactly. Like, exactly. Ah! Now they had a whole long list of adverse events and these were all, um, most of these were within the device itself. And rather than go through the whole list here, just know that they did a lot of measurements of the device, both yeah. before and after they did the intervention, this, the MRI scanner. They looked at everything. They looked the at battery, everything. everything. And, and all of the internal programming and all the sensing and all the, yeah. it, all kinds of stuff. And they did talk to the patients actually yeah. in there and yeah. said, you know, how did you feel in there as well? The, the parameters themselves, if you're interested, please go to the paper or check the slides because you don't, if yeah. impedance, I just read the word impedance no. and like my head exploded. Yeah. So I just, this thresholds and not, not, I can't, very, I care. I'm sure it's super exciting if you're it an is. electrophysiology it, I, and I'm person. Sure they'd be like, this is really cool. And I probably was, except that I really want to know if the patient's yeah. just going to yeah. stop their heart while yeah. they're in there or yeah. shock themselves or something. So, and they had all these ranges, but just know they measured a whole bunch of stuff. Now they did a ton of studies. There were 2,100 exams, that 1,509 patients had 2,100 exams. And of the devices that they had, most were just pacemakers, but a significant proportion were ICD. So they had lots of these devices. And some of the patients didn't have just one MR. Yeah. They ended up having multiple MRs. So that device that they had got hit with MR zapping this. And 18 of the patients, six or more times. I mean, that, I mean <laughs> they, they had a lot. Uh, there were 196 people who had at least two MRs. It was remarkable, amazing. Basically, and they, all these patients had the measurements they wanted, the before, immediately before and immediately after. One of the things where the paper kind of loses it a little bit is that they didn't have long-term follow-up in everybody. They only had long-term follow-up in about two-thirds. Um, and when they really just sussed it all out, basically most, 96% of the MRs didn't have anything happen at all. 4% did, but 96% didn't. It's pretty boring. That's I mean, not, and not that's a, In a good happened. way. It is, that's, yeah, exactly. <laughs> now, what did happen? 
there is apparently something in your device called the power on reset, where basically what happens is it turns itself back on again and does what it was programmed to do. Eight patients had that happen during nine different exams, but none of them had anything that needed to be addressed, except one patient who had an old machine anyway, and they had needed to replace that. So they said, even though this power on reset thing where, oh, whoops, it's turned on again, um, it didn't cause any trouble. They did have to stop the MR prematurely in five cases. Out now, of a lot. Like, so this is a yeah, this is small, out of 2,100, yeah, exactly. five. I mean, this is nothing. Yeah. Three of them, the device basically screwed up the MR itself. So it was, wasn't, it was just this interference thing. One patient got bradycardic um, when they reprogrammed. After, after, the, after the, the pre-MRI reprogramming. Yeah, right. so they basically pre, they were reprogramming it to make them to a VVI pacemaker and one person got bradycardic. So that was one of the problems. And then one of them, the patient was going into VT, but the patient was already set to get ablated for their VT. So, oh well, that's whatever. Yeah. Um, they, they did find that the, all those parameter measurements, yeah. if you are l so into it, you can actually read about these. There were a few little glitches up and down that were not clinically significant. No device needed to be reprogrammed or revised, none of them, despite all these internal little things that happened. So when they discuss it in this article, they basically say that the most common ab thing that happened based on the MR was this power on reset thing. It really didn't cause any problems in the patients except the one patient that needed it replaced, but they needed it replaced anyway. One patient had mild discomfort, that was about it. Um, they add, it didn't make any difference where you were being MR'd. You could be MR'd on your knee, or MR'd in your head, or MR'd in your chest, and it's still, it, there was no difference on where you, you had the MR as far as your event, if there was anything. They do mention that if you do this, it's probably good to have external pacemakers around too, just in case everything goes kaput and you need to use the external pacemaker. So they mention that. So if you want to sort of, oh, oh they, they also mention limitations, which are probably very important. One is this was a single center. I'm not sure with this much, this many numbers, yeah. it makes that difference in what they were measuring. It's not like a center thing. It's just, it I is agree. what it is. Yeah. Um, and they did lose some people to long-term follow-up. So we don't know if their device like, pooped out, you know, a year from now. <laughs> like they fried it early. Yeah, yeah they, they, they suddenly, they you know, got know. shocked a million times. We don't know that, but there's no evidence yeah. of that anywhere. Um, and they only studied these one and a half Tesla MRIs and there are different ones out there now. Yeah. And they only studied the devices that were available at the yeah. time. And there's always more, like there's always more of those things coming out. Yeah. So this, as it changes, it might not be valid, but overall they said it's safe in all but one patient. That patient basically needed to have that device changed anyway, no clinically significant adverse events. So ta-da, the summary is good to go. Have backup pacing recommended, and my take home on this is go back to how they did this in the first place. You are not going to do this by yourself. Yeah. They have to reset the device before, reset the device after. It's great to know if you need it. Um, you're going to call a cardiologist, I guess. That's what I would yeah. do at this Most, point. I don't know. At our hospital, we have like a protocol. You know, a person with a pacemaker that yeah. needs an MRI, this is how we do it. And it's good to have those because, you know, when it happens, you, you're going to yeah, start arguing. Cardiology, cardiology? Yeah, we do. Mm -hmm. And we, and, and, you know, but we, it, it doesn't happen that frequently. We had one recently where the cardiology fellow who was on was like arguing about it, like, because they just had never heard of the policy because oh. they never experienced it. It was like, no, we actually have this written down. It's your, sorry, you have to like deal with this. And mm -hmm. they were just kind of like, why is this my problem? you know, kind of thing. Because so, you're like, a cardiologist. It's, so it's good to have that like agreed yeah, upon with, true. you know, not in the middle of the night between, so, you know, your departments, radiology, cardiology, yeah. emergency medicine, get together. If we have this situation, this is who we call, this is who's going to do it, who's, this is who's going to sit with them in the MRI That's scanner. That's really important because yeah. it's interesting because the next, I think it's the next article we talk about, there are times where you do need an MR. Yeah. Um, and you yep. need it right now. And you, you need can't it. wait till yep. tomorrow or you yep. can't wait till we can talk about this in the light of right. day. So it's nice to have a policy. Yep. So yep. this is the article on MRI safety. Well, we'll talk about when you might actually need one here in a second. Yeah.